Hey there, welcome to LiveWire. I'm your host, Luke Burbank. This week on the show, we are going to be talking tiny, beautiful things with the legendary Cheryl Strayed. It's the 10th year anniversary of that book that she wrote, uh, which is also being turned into a TV series starring Katherine Hahn. Uh, we're going to ask Cheryl what it's like being portrayed by an American treasure for the second time because Reese Witherspoon played Cheryl in the movie Wild, of course. Uh, we're also going to talk to writer Joseph Earl Thomas about his memoir, Sink, which the New York Times calls an extraordinary memoir of a black American boyhood. And then we are going to hear some music from the amazing Stephanie Ann Johnson. That's the plan for this week. We've got some not so tiny, but we think very beautiful public radio lined up for you this week on Livewire. Stick around. It all gets started right after this. Ever wondered what it's like to live alone, hidden in the woods, not speaking to a single soul for 30 years, or wander the desert, uncover a hidden well, and dive to the bottom of the deepest waterhole for 2,000 miles? The Snap Judgment Podcast takes you there with amazing stories told by the people who lived them. Snap Judgment. Listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, Elena. Hey, Luke. How's it going? It's going very well, actually, this week. Are you ready for our our weekly station location identification examination appointment? Yes, I am so ready. Like we need one more letter on that acronym. Now we're adding <laughs> appointment to the end of it. This is where I quiz you about a place in the country where LiveWire is on the radio. you got to guess the place I'm talking about. November 12th, 1970. The Department of Transportation used a half a ton of dynamite to blow up a dead whale that had watched up on the beach in the city, and uh, it did not go great. Uh, I totally teach this video when I used to teach freshman <laughs> comp when I was trying to teach, like, who are the involved parties? I would show uh -huh. the whale blowing up, and I would be like, who are the people who would be concerned with this issue? <laughs> I believe it's Gold Beach, Oregon. Is that right? It is close. Ah, Florence. Florence. Florence, Oregon. Now, the Gold Beach might be the name of the beach. The town that we are on the radio is Florence, Oregon, where KLFO-FM is playing the program. Now, you're right. The concerned parties, it turned out, Elena, would be anyone within the blast radius <laughs> yeah. who were covered in whale blubber and other unmentionable things. I love that video uh, so much. <laughs> it is, it's a real treasure. Anyway, shout out to everyone in Florence, Oregon. All right, should we get to the program? Let's do it. All right, take it away. From PRX, it's... <laughs> This week, writer and advice columnist Cheryl Strayed. I don't know what you should do, but I am willing to go down there with you into all the corners and crevices and try to figure it out. And writer Joseph Earl Thomas. I'm driving on the expressway and I'm getting on the on the ramp and there's somebody with like an iguana <laughs> or whatever, like trying to sell me the iguana and like homemade iced tea. With music from Stephanie Ann Johnson and our fabulous house band. I'm your announcer, Elena Passarello, and now the host of Livewire, Luke Burbank. Hey, thank you so much, Elena Passarello. Thanks to everyone listening all over the country, including in beautiful Florence, Oregon. We have a great show in store for you this week. We've asked the listeners a question. We asked, what advice would you give yourself? 10 years ago. This is because we're going to be talking to Cheryl Strayed, who gives out advice as the Dear Sugar columnist. She's a recognized master in the field. We're going to hear those responses coming up in a few minutes. First, though, it's time for the best news we've heard all week. Best news. This is our little reminder, start of the show, that there's some good news happening out there in the world. Elena, what is the best news that you heard all week? Okay, uh, this is news to me, but this is actually a thing that's been going on for over a decade. And it's just such a great idea. I love it so much. And I wish I lived closer to Staten Island, New York. Okay. Where uh, in 2007, after the loss of his beloved Italian mother, a man named Joe Scaravella was looking for something to do with his grief. And I don't know what line of work he was in, but he was not a restaurateur. He definitely wants us to know that because he opened up a restaurant. 
<laughs> okay. It's called Enoteca Maria, named after his beloved mother, who not just was a mother, she was a nonna or a grandmother. And basically, he was operating on this very uh, commonly felt sentiment that the best food you've ever had in your whole life was mm-hmm. made by your grandma. Yes. I mean, I'm a, one of the rare people who've had, I have five grandmothers because of all the divorces and remarriages in my family. <laughs> and that, not all of them were great cooks, but a couple of them, my step father's mother, uh, Grandmother Horton, man, she could make a Southern table of food. With a last name like Passarello, I thought that you were going to go a lot more, uh, you know, Mamma Mia on it. That's a spicy meatball. No, you know, South Carolina uh, Italians, they just didn't. I mean, I guess they just dumped tomato sauce on red beans and rice. <laughs> and something. That, that's not where the cooking comes from in my family. It's the Southerners that really could cook. But anyway, so at Ina Teca Maria, starting in 2007, Joe Scaravella welcomed different nunnas around the community to come in and they'd have a night and they would make the dishes that they knew best. They would be in charge of the kitchen. The whole staff would uh, work for them and would perfect these recipes for whoever wanted to come in and taste the food. And of course it went over like gangbusters. Yeah. So fast forward like seven years later in 2015, he expanded the concept to include nunnas from around the world. So now, uh, three nights a week, Friday and Saturday and Sunday, a different grandmother cooks cuisine from a different cultural place. And there's like something like 15 countries represented. So Nona Carmen from Argentina is cooking, Nona Rosa from Peru, Nona Linda from Hong Kong, Nona Irene from Puerto Rico. There's also Turkey, Italy, as we know, Greece, Egypt, Trinidad, and Tobago. And they all come in and they have, they've now developed neighborhood favorites, people who wait for a certain nonna to come back up on the calendar. Oh my gosh. And uh, Joe Scaravella brought up a really interesting point. You know, it's crazy grueling to run a restaurant, but it's not so bad to cook just one night a couple of months out of the year. And a lot of these folks are empty nesters or their kids have grown up and moved away or they're widows. And so it makes them feel really good to come in and just have complete and total reign over a kitchen and to make people happy and to become kind of nunnas for the greater Staten Island community. That's amazing. The best news that I saw this week uh, is coming from Chicago, where there is an orthopedic surgeon who specializes in operating on on young patients. Uh, Her name is Felicity Fishman at Shriners Children's in Chicago. And um, her specialty, along with the surgery, of course, is the aftercare, where what she does is she draws a very elaborate drawing on the casts of the kids that she has done surgery on. They talk about a two-year-old kid named Wesley who's having a surgery on his hand and woke up, this was at his request, by the way, with a bright green and yellow Tyrannosaurus Rex (sighs) that had been drawn on there. The way that Dr. Fishman does this is She's got a whole bunch of photos of previous drawings on her phone. And when she has a young patient in there and they're kind of doing the initial consult, she shows them all the pictures she's done or asks them to just come up with something out of their head. And then she draws it while they're still kind of coming to from having had the surgery. And so they wake up with these like really amazing, elaborate, pretty good like art renderings on their casts. There's a kid named Michael who's had to have seven surgeries because of a congenital bone length thing. Uh, And so he's had all kinds of stuff. He's had a chicken wearing sneakers. (laughs) He had Thanos from the Marvel movies one time. And he like loves it so much. This is the one downside of this is that none of the kids want to have the cast taken off. Uh. (laughs) <laughs> because they're enjoying how cool the art is. They also don't want anyone else to sign it. Oh. But these kids are apparently like loving this artwork and it's really it seems like it makes a, a, the experience a lot better for them. You know, having a cast is really not fun, but if you can at least have a cool piece of art on your arm or ankle or wherever it might be, um, that makes it a little better. So shout out to Dr. Felicity Fishman Woo-hoo. at Shriners Children in Chicago to make things a little better for these young patients. That's the best news that I heard this week. All right, let's welcome our first guest on over to the show. Uh, She's the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, Wild, 
From Lost to Found on the Pacific Crest Trail. Uh, That book has sold more than 4 million copies. It was also made into an Oscar-nominated film, which I'm sure many of the people listening saw. Uh, It was starring Reese Witherspoon. And also, Cheryl Strayed has for many years been an advice columnist writing under the name Dear Sugar. Um, She put out a book called Tiny Beautiful Things that was a collection of these pieces of advice. It's also being turned into a series on Hulu, starring Katherine Hahn. Uh, Cheryl joined us on stage at the Alberta Rose Theater in Portland, Oregon, recently to talk about the book. Take a listen to this. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad to be in Portland on stage in front of actual people. These real people are so glad to have you here, Cheryl. Um, I, it was really fun to get to kind of revisit Tiny Beautiful Things, which like just turned 10 years old. That's right. And I was reading in the preface, uh, you wrote, the only thing that you hope to do as a writer is to make people feel less alone. And I'm wondering, how do you actually do that as a writer? Well, it's really simple and also really complex, right? I do what other writers have done to me, really, since I began to read when I was six years old. I remember feeling so deeply struck by the power of words on the page, the the way that it could make you feel seen, the way that it could make you know pain and beauty. You could feel somebody else's struggle in your own heart. And my mission as a writer has always been to simply join the ranks of those people who do that. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, the simplicity is tell the truth, be as raw and honest and transparent as possible on the page. That's what I try to do. And of course, that's incredibly hard to do as well. Particularly when, if we're talking about tiny, beautiful things, people are asking you for guidance and some of the Mm -hmm. folks are going through unimaginable circumstances. Yeah. Um, uh, I'm curious, where were you at in your life, like personally, when you took on the unpaid assignment (laughs) to become Sugar, this advice column, this anonymous advice columnist? Well, I I was at the time, I had my kids who are now teenagers, were little like preschoolers Mm. and I had just finished the first draft of Wild and I had sent it off to my editor and I didn't know what would happen with that book. My husband, who's a documentary filmmaker, um, and I were just two struggling artists living in Southeast Portland at the time. And I was asked to write this column and the the pay was zero, (laughs) which is a a wage that I was very familiar with at that time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, where I was is skeptical that I could do it because I am not a therapist. I never took a class in psychology. I never myself had even gone through therapy at that point in my really? life. Really? Yeah, really. There's like a lot of wisdom in, in this advice you're giving, which I assumed was the result of a lot of therapy. And I was so unqualified for it. <laughs> or, you know, I don't know or if this so book I is thought. such a good idea, <laughs> yeah. being honest. But you know what? What I realized once I started to write the column is that I had trained as a writer. Mm. And to be a writer, it goes back to that first thing I just said to you. It is to attempt to tell the truth about who I am and who we are and who you are and to create, whether it be in a fictional way, characters who seem real, or to write about myself on the page in a way that will resonate with others. Um, And so I just put all of that into this work as Dear Sugar. And I decided to, that because stories had been what had helped me in all of my struggles and hardships and losses, and there had been many um, by that point in my life, that I could use stories that saved me in those struggles and hardships to help other people. And so that's how I approached the Dear Sugar column. I'm not, I, you know, I, I often advise people, go to therapy, because I'm not a therapist. <laughs> uh-huh. But here is a story I can tell you mm-hmm. that might help illuminate the question you've asked me. Well, actually, I want to ask you a little bit about that when we come back from the break. I'm curious your process of writing as Sugar, because I know that your book Wild went through a writer's group and lots of revision and bouncing it off of people. But we got to take a quick break. This is Live Wire Radio. We're talking to Cheryl Strayed about her collection, Tiny Beautiful Things. We'll be back in just a moment. <laughs> Thank you. 
Livewire is brought to you in part by Alaska Airlines. Alaska Airlines offers the most non-stops from the West Coast, including destinations like Hawaii, Costa Rica, and Belize. And as a member of the One World Alliance, Alaska Airlines can connect you to more than 1,000 destinations worldwide with their global partners. Learn more at alaskaair.com. Welcome back to LiveWire from PRX. I'm Luke Burbank here with Elena Passarello. We are coming to you this week from the Alberta Rose Theater in Portland, Oregon. Yes, indeed. And talking to Cheryl Strayed about uh, her collection, Tiny Beautiful Things, which just celebrated a 10-year anniversary. Um, so I'm curious how you write these advice uh, sort of pieces um, because they're very important, obviously, to the people who they're directed at and to the rest of us who read them. So you want to get them right. Does, do they go through the same writerly process that your other sort of pros do? No. <laughs> they, you know, it's weird. I break all of my own rules in the Dear Sugar column in terms of the way it gets written and edited, which is that I write it and my husband reads it and says, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, it's good. And then I, I press publish. You know, I, I still write the column now as a Substack newsletter. Mm -hmm. It was born on the internet, originally on the rumpus. And, you know, all these years later, you know, it was always that kind of very organic kind of writing. Very often I write those columns, almost all of those columns. And the book it has been reissued. There are some new columns in mm -hmm. it. Um, and, you know, I really write all of those columns, almost all of them, within a day or two. Mm -hmm. And I don't know why that form in particular is, is more unfiltered or unedited than, than my other writing, but it is. It's just how it comes out. What about the distance between when you receive the question and you compose the response? Is that also super brief, or do you sometimes have to ruminate or stew or think it through? I, you know, I do all of that stuff. Like, sometimes I'll get a letter and I'll think about it for months. Mm -hmm. Other times I'll get a letter and I'll realize this is going to be the letter I'm going to answer, and I, you know, I write it the next day. Mm. So it really, it has to capture my imagination. I feel like I have to have something to say about it a story to tell about it. Mm. I also look for range because I never wanted the Dear Sugar column to only be like a love, sex, and romance column. I want to write about relationships of all varieties. I want to write about money and, you know, should I move to Cincinnati or mm -hmm. stay living in Portland? You know, mm. all of these different questions I want to include in Dear Sugar. Mm. Um, do you ever second guess yourself? All the time. Are you <laughs> kidding me? I mean... And that's the, that is, I think, such a key piece of what Dear Sugar is, is the premise is, I am not the wise one who knows, and you should just gather around and listen to me tell you what to do, even though I absolutely love to do that. <laughs> I don't try to do that in Dear Sugar. What I try to do is say, I don't know what you should do, but I am willing to go down there with you into all the corners and crevices and try to figure it out, grapple with these questions, illuminate maybe the question that sits beneath the question that you've asked me. I try to listen really closely mm. to the language that people use to describe their, their struggle. Mm. And I very often, the best advice is to say back to people what they said to me. Mm. You know, a lot of letters are, I don't know what to do. And always in the letter, they have said what they want to do. <laughs> and my job is to say, you said this is what you really want. And so what the real problem isn't you don't know what you want. The real problem is that you are afraid to want what you want. You're afraid to know what you know. And that is big stuff. So that's what I try to do in Dear Sugar is show people that. We're talking to Cheryl Strayed here on Livewire about... Tiny Beautiful Things, Advice from Dear Sugar. Um, obviously, the best questions, the most intriguing, uh, are going to be what make it into the book. But some of them are just so beautifully written mm -hmm. that I wonder, are they exquisitely made up? And does that even <laughs> matter? Like, do you think there's a percentage of of questions that come in that are, you know, maybe somebody is just kind of wondering what it would be like to be in that situation. And again, does it really matter? Oh, that's interesting. 
I, you know, I've never been asked that question. Usually people think that I've made them up, you know, that I've written them, <laughs> which, is, which is always fascinating to me because, you know, what I think what happens is people know that this advice column is a more literary one. Mm -hmm. So I think that the column attracts a lot of people who are either writers or just good writers. Yes. And of course, I'm attracted to letters that are well-written. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I've never, it's never occurred to me that somebody was presenting a problem or a question that wasn't true. Um, but it probably doesn't matter, you know, if a few have gotten through that it's like, no, you're not really in this situation. You're just wondering about it. But usually I, I know because almost always the letter writers follow up with me. I've met like babies that were born because, you know, they read the column. That is an awesome amount of power. It's yeah. <laughs> the power to create life. <laughs> but no, people sometimes come to me and say, yeah, I read that column and I did this. Uh-huh. You know, which, so which not is even so, the people that had written the letter, right, but exactly. just the wider world of readers, of course. Of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because that, that, too, is the trick about Dear Sugar, is, you know, one person might be wondering if they should have a baby or not, um, but a lot of people are wondering that mm -hmm. same thing. And, and one person might be grieving the death of their father, but a lot of people are out there mm -hmm. grieving the death of their father. So mm -hmm. that's, that's how Dear Sugar works, and I think all advice columns, is that we go, to, we gravitate to them because we, those, those problems or struggles or secrets or sorrows we have, they're very universal. Mm -hmm. This is a question that when I thought of it, I thought it was profound, but then I reflected on it and realized it's probably the number one question you get asked about this, <laughs> which is, do you find yourself better at giving advice to other people than giving yourself advice or living out these principles that you're sort of describing? Oh, of course. <laughs> of course. I mean, I can't even imagine how insufferable I'd be if I, if I managed to, like, actually live out and take all of my best advice. <laughs> You know, I mean, that's just, the, but, you know, I will say, however, you know, being sugar has made me a better person hmm. because so often in, you know, the, my advice is, you know, this is what it would look like if you evolved. This is what it would look like if you were courageous. This is what it would look like if you were compassionate to others and to yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's essentially I'm saying here's here's a vision of the best version of you, and so when I try to, to help people see that in themselves, I'm forced to see it in myself too. How could I evolve? You know, so I'm always again I always think of this advice as horizontal. It's not you know I'm the wise person saying what you should do, but I am the person sitting next to you, saying I don't know either, but let's see what we can do. This has uh, been adapted into a Hulu original series um, where I guess you'll be portrayed by the wonderful Catherine Hahn, who is a national treasure. Yes. Are yes. you just used to, at this point, seeing yourself <laughs> at various stages of your life represented <laughs> by awesome actors like Reese Witherspoon or Catherine Hahn? I know. It is, for sure, the weirdest thing that has ever happened to me. I mean, I never, I was never one of those people, you know, when they're like, well, who would play you in a movie or a TV show? Like, I never was one of those people who had an answer for that. <laughs> so I don't know how I have stumbled into this reality, but yes, indeed, Catherine Hahn is playing Sugar. Uh, the show will be out on April 7th. All eight episodes are going to be dumped at once, so you can just sit Thank there and binge that. it. Thank you for that. Yes. I know. Yes. I have lost... I Whatever part of my brain was dedicated to being patient about television series <laughs> Me too. has atrophied. I need that. Me too. Daddy needs that right away. I all know. the episodes. Yeah. That seems like a dear sugar issue. Yes. Maybe yeah, you yeah. could write in yeah. no, about I, I refuse to watch a show that is doled out week by week yeah. now. I just no. cannot take it. Yeah. Yeah. But So Catherine Hahn is absolutely a genius. And we needed somebody who could really be very funny but also very dramatic and deep. I mean, the show is going to make you cry mm. as often as it makes you laugh. And she plays Sugar. She doesn't play me. You know, we, we, she's a sort of fictional iteration of me. The, the showrunner, Liz Tigelar, likes to say, this Sugar in, in, the, in our show is like Cheryl if she hadn't hiked the Pacific Crest Trail. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a long way of saying she's a lot more messed up than me. So... You know, wow. thank goodness, you know, I get to have a little separation. Here, here was the premise, really. We were like, okay, this is a, a fictional character who's kind of got some things, and, you know, she's kind of like me, 
and her past is like mine. So when she remembers her past, and we see these, these flashback scenes, the wonderful actress Sarah Pigeon plays the young oh, wow. Claire. Now, the things that she's acting out are very much more from my actual life. Because I said, listen, she's got to have, in order to tell the stories I tell in the column, she has to have a dead mother. She has to have gotten married and divorced young. She has to have grown up poor and working class. She has to have, you know, always wanted to be a writer. So those big parts of the, the, the strands, essentially, that made me are behind her. Mm. And then in the present day, in the form of Catherine Hahn, we just got to let, let loose and let it be really fictional, which I absolutely loved. And so I didn't have to feel, I guess, this sense of, wait a minute, that's not how it really was. I got to just really let it go. And I was a writer on the show. I'm an executive producer on the show. So I was really able to be very involved creatively and also feel a sense of, you know, what serves the story, not, not what's a reflection of my actual life. Now, you being a writer on the show, though, there's got to be a writer's room, right? Yeah. But who outranks Sugar <laughs> in the writer's room of the Hulu original series about you? Like, I mean, aren't, doesn't everyone at some point have to go, well, I mean, it's Cheryl. <laughs> I guess Cheryl wins the argument again. Well, you know, I, I occupied a very specific position, I think, in the room, because, first of all, the showrunner... Liz Tigelar is just an absolute wonderful person. And she really, from the beginning, welcomed me in. And I said to her, listen, I'm not a TV writer. This is my first time in the room. I'm an apprentice to the craft. Hmm. I am not coming in as, you know, the diva or the one who's going to insist on anything. I really want to be in this room. And it was um, Liz and I and, and seven other writers. Mm -hmm. And what I did is I, I contributed what, I, what they wanted from me, which was a lot of the, essentially the meaning and story of what is, what is the meaning of the Dear Sugar column. And some of those scenes from my, you know, young life. But I also really listened to them, and I learned a lot. And that has been, I think, it's the advice I would give to any writer at any stage of their career, is always be an apprentice. Mm -hmm. Never mm -hmm. go in thinking that you are the, the, the one, you know, who knows. Be that, sit always in that horizontal chair mm -hmm. that you get to sit across from people and learn from what they have to say. And so it was a, a, an amazing experience. Uh, the uh, book is Tiny Beautiful Things. Uh, look for the original series on Hulu. Cheryl Strait, thank you, as thank always, you. for coming on LiveWire. Thank you. That was Cheryl Strait right here on LiveWire. You can read the 10th anniversary edition of Tiny Beautiful Things and catch the Hulu series version of Tiny Beautiful Things starring Katherine Hahn. That's coming up next month. Special thanks this episode to Martin McLennan of Portland, Oregon. Martin is part of the Livewire member community and generously supports our show with a donation each month. And we are very thankful for that support, Martin, because it is how we are able to keep doing Livewire. So, Martin, thank you so much for keeping the show going. <laughs> This is Livewire, as we like to do each week. We asked our listeners a question. We asked, what advice would you give yourself 10 years ago? Of course, 10 years ago is around the time that Cheryl Strayed started writing as Dear Sugar. Folks sent in their responses to that. Elena has been collecting them up. What do you see in? Uh, this one from Chloe is really good. Don't fall for the thin eyebrow trend. Don't wax them. Don't overpluck. <laughs> Leave them alone. I don't think anybody ever told me. I mean, this is not a problem that I have. I'm like a Groucho Marx level of eyebrows, but I didn't. I didn't know that if you plucked your eyebrows, they might not grow back. So there are all these people who can't cash in on the '90s full Brooke Shields trend because they just eradicated their eyebrows in the Ozies. <laughs> I always wondered why, when I was a little kid, the the there was a number of women, kind of maybe on the more sort of elderly side, who worked at the pharmacy across the street, Craigan's Pharmacy, mm -hmm. and that was my first experience with someone who's just straight up drawing their eyebrows on. Yeah, and I, I remember thinking that's an interesting choice, but it's got to be because maybe those things. Don't grow back so no. <laughs> so heartily. <laughs> uh, what's uh, something else? A piece of advice that a listener would give their their self from ten years ago. Oh my God! This one from Ariel. Listen, everybody, listen to Ariel. Stretch. 
oh, if I would have stretched more 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I would, there would be so many aches and pains that I know would not be present. But, you know, I'm supposed to stretch now and I'm not doing mm-hmm. it. Is it what? Is it just that the the time commitment? Is it that you're just busy with other things? What what, what would stop you from doing this thing that you know will make uh, your life better in ten years? I don't like being told what to do, even when I tell myself what to do. You know? Yeah, I I, I know it's just amazing. And boy, this is turning into a real geriatric segment for us. But it's, <laughs> there are so many things like stretching and eyebrow maintenance that just <laughs> it's just a different world when you get into your you know your middle age where I am so it's true uh, I should probably take a hint too and and do some stretching as well okay some other advice that someone would be giving themselves from 10 years ago what do you think about this one from Derek Derek would like to advise his earlier self no one cares and that's a good thing oh <laughs> right, right? That's kind of um, very stoic, right? Like if you think about the fact that sort of none of this matters, Mm -hmm. you could take that as something that would make you feel kind of bummed out, but you could also take it as something that means anything that happens is okay because none of it matters. Yeah. Nobody cares. So why are we ever giving ourselves a hard time? Right. I'm sure people care like they're empathetic, but like in terms of like people judging you, honestly, like you're not taking up that much space in other people's experiences. And that's good. (laughs) Yes. All right. Thanks to everyone who sent in a response to our listener question. We've got another one for next week's show, which we will reveal at the end of this program. So stick around for that. In the meantime, we should welcome our next guest to the program. The New York Times called his new book a remarkable debut and an extraordinary memoir of a black American boyhood. The book is called Sink, and in it he investigates his hazardous upbringing and the way that geek culture really saved him. Uh, He's also an associate faculty member at the Brooklyn Institute for Social Research and the director of programs at Blue Stoop, which is a literary hub for writers from Philly. Uh, Joseph Earl Thomas joined us on stage at the Alberta Rose Theater to talk about his memoir. Take a listen to this. Joseph, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Can you start by just kind of describing your family structure as you lay it out in this book? You're, you're growing up in Philly in the kind of mid and late 90s, and you're, you're in a home with uh, your mother, who's there kind of intermittently, mm-hmm. and then you've got sort of a grandmother and grandfather character, but like, what was the scene for you growing up? Yeah, so it was, you know, kind of a mixed family. My um, mother had her own kind of problems that she was dealing with, right, like primarily with addiction and kind of the way that the world generally treats black women in all these different kinds of ways, right, of course. And then um, my grandmother, who was her mother, was also there with us, but also didn't really have the capacity to care for folks, right? Um, And so a man that she married, my grandfather, he was the one who kind of, in some ways, right, in the way that like the kind of old school kind of man, capital M, takes care of the house, right? He was the person who did that. So it's like a kind of toggling um, back and forth with a lot of adults who are in difficult situations, right? Who are also trying to take care of, of not just me, one child, but my brother and my sister, etc. One of the things that you do that's really interesting in this book is you write about yourself in the third person a lot. You write about Joey. When did you decide that that was going to be uh, an approach you were going to take to describing this? Um, it took a while. Uh, mm-hmm. I will say that You know, right, of course, when you read a memoir, one expects it to be in the first person. That is the kind of most popular deployment of, like, interiority in that way. But, um, you know, as far as, like, writing goes, that's not the most common convention, right? It's the most common convention. It's third person, or this thing that we think of as, like, free and direct discourse, right? If we think about, like, literature, uh, uh, people, you know, the exemplar of that form being someone like Toni Morrison, right, who is so good at doing this kind of simultaneously objective, subjective thing that you don't even notice that she's doing it all the time right. with a bunch of different characters and a bunch of different settings, um, et cetera. And, you know, for me, I went around, it was in second person, it was in first person, it was in third person. <laughs> I was doing a lot of different stuff. And, um, you know, there were friends, like early readers, some of which I'll never forget, you know, uh, one of my friends, she's like, what are you doing? You know, you, this is just Everybody so Everybody needs that friend. Yeah, yeah, you don't exactly. need five of that friend <laughs> because that's too yeah, much. Yeah, you can't have five. You'll never get anything done if you have five of them. Yeah. And, um, you know, she's like, oh, this, she's like, I think you're a good writer. I think you kind of know what you are doing. 
why are you trying to play all these games? And she's like, I'm sure this is a lot of fun for you. I'm like, yes, it is a lot of fun. <laughs> um, you know, the kind of playing with form thing that you do as a writer. But ultimately, you need to build in some kind of coherence. And so I settled primarily on third. It does also go into second. Um, I settled on that and thinking about like what the difficulties of becoming like an I or like self-contained person who can refer to oneself as like, this is I, me person versus like what the world is giving you or forcing you to kind of uh, contend with, right? So it gets kind of closer and closer, but never really turns into like an I by the end. Mm. Uh, we're talking to Joseph Earl Thomas. His new memoir is Sync. One of the things you write about is the stuff that you were really interested in was often not the stuff the kids you went to school with or other yeah. kids you hung out with were really into, like the No Doubt song, Don't Speak. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was a, that was a sticking point. Um, <laughs> As well, right? So, you know, a lot of, like, my... The things I was interested in with regards to music had to do with, like, my aunt, for example, mm -hmm. um, who was the person I was closest with growing up. Uh, and a lot of that was, like, hip-hop and R&B, more R&B, right? This is, like, 90s R&B heyday, like, really kind of overpouring emotion, kind of kind of R&B music. Um, and then, you know, there was other stuff, too, right? So I was interested in, like, anime and video games in a way that, like, now it's kind of commonplace. That, mm -hmm. you know, if you ask any person, you know, under the age of, like, 25-ish, they're going to be like, what is one of the main things to do? They play video games, watch anime almost, like, continuously. Yeah, people right. very much like to embrace the term geek now. Yes, it's, it is it's, very popular But it now. was different in Philly yeah. in, like, 97. You know, I think it was different everywhere in, like, in like yeah. 95, 96, 97, you know? Um, but it became more, you know, more acceptable and, and, and kind of grew to have a broader following. Or in other words, like people recognized that it was like a kind of goofy moniker to be like, these are the people who I don't like mm -hmm. or I do like or whatever, right? It's like no longer like a subculture and now it's a thing that a bunch of people do or are interested in. But how big of a deal was it for you? Because you're living in, in a household where, you know, there's violence and where there's people struggling with addiction and you're also being bullied a lot when you're out in the world and you're just constantly trying to not get your ass kicked, basically. Basically. How yeah. big, like, what role then does, like, Dragon Ball Z and <laughs> anime and things like that take on in your life more than just a way to pass the time but maybe a way to feel differently about your world? So, you know, one of the things that one gets asked, especially when they write a book, is like, oh, did you come up reading? Or, you know, were you that, like, little quiet kid sitting in the corner, you know, reading the book or whatever? And I wasn't. My immediate family, like, no one really read, right? Like, no one, you know, cared about school. Um, but I play video games. And at the time, right, of course, these weren't voiced uh, in the way that they are now, right? So you would sit there reading for, like, seven or eight hours, you know, right. um, a day trying to get through this game. And it was like your progress was dependent upon your being able to interpret what was going on in the story or the satisfaction that you could get from it. So that um, became important or like a way of thinking about the world, too. Mm -hmm. um, you also were, uh, as you write in the book, uh, very interested in animals. You would love yeah. you. There was this place, birds, 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 down the street. <laughs> yeah. What did they sell there? It's a very apt name. It's a very good name for a pet store. If you ever open a pet store, you should name it Birds, Birds, Birds. But like, <laughs> you had a lot of adventures there, like getting things that sadly mostly didn't didn't yeah. have maybe didn't didn't make it that long. But the thing that was really wild was. You bought an alligator? I did, yeah. So I didn't know this until a friend of mine brought it up the other day in like a, in a, a different interview. He's like, why do people in Philly love animals so much? And I was like, what do you even mean? He's like, I'm driving on the expressway and I'm getting on the, on the ramp and there's somebody with like an iguana <laughs> or whatever, like trying to sell me the iguana and like homemade iced tea. <laughs> Like when you're getting on I-76 and I was like, oh, I didn't know that that's only here. And then I thought about it. I was like, oh, that doesn't happen everywhere. Yeah, no. And it was winter, right? That's the crazier part, right? Like oh it's an iguana. God. Anyway, so, so that's a problem. Uh, so that's jump. actually something that's, that, a, thing, that's a fairly yeah. regular thing to mm -hmm. kind of get animals that are maybe not, let's say, native to Philly. No. Like hermit, an alligator. Like hermit crabs, you know, like iguanas, like green animals. I don't know. We could go forever down the list of animals. But... Um, I did get this alligator because I was like, oh, Rex. what is, yes, Rex, which I thought was like a really good that alligator name. That is a good name, alligator name. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, what's a better alligator name than no, that? That's not, good. it can't be. Um, yeah, you used to be able to just buy them from, from pet shops or at least a pet shop near me. And, um, birds, birds, birds. Birds, birds, birds. Comma, alligator. <laughs> for context, it's not there anymore. No. Right. Yeah, which is important, I think, for the story. Um, and... <laughs> And 
I, for me, I was like, oh, this is the coolest pet that you could get, right? I'm a, I was a kid who, was, you know, amongst other things, I was watching like Steve Irwin on like uh -huh. Animal Planet. <laughs> well, I mean, it's it, you don't have to have a PhD in psychology to identify <laughs> a young person who's just really craving connection. I made me want to like go give you a hug. <laughs> I hugged a lot of those animals and they didn't make it, so <laughs> I don't really. <laughs> All right, I guess might, I'm. Might I, I guess I'm glad I wasn't around for this. A little bit, yeah. Joseph, it could be complicated. By the way, we're talking to Joseph Earl Thomas about his new book, uh, Sink, which is a memoir. This book is is getting really, really rapturous reviews, including um, a review in the New York Times that was just um, extremely positive. About, uh, about how well the book is executed and your story. I'm wondering what that feels like for you because this book is intense and it's very uh, vivid and very real to your life growing up and there's a lot of trauma and pain in the book. And then you have people being like, congrats, the New York Times likes your trauma. Mm -hmm. Like, how does that feel? You By know, the way, I congratulated you for the review before the yeah. show. So I'm that gonna, person. Like, yeah. I, that's me. The, the meta textual moment was coming in like two seconds. <laughs> uh, if it wasn't. No, I mean, one of the things I think about a lot and in the book and in my own life, right, is like the relationship between, um, you know, privacy and what is public. And I think that to a certain extent, you need um, some kind of privacy in order to feel the shock of something being public later on. Mm -hmm. And because um, for myself and for a lot of folks that I have known and grew up with, privacy wasn't always an option. These were kind of like open, you know, not hardly even open secrets, right? Like every other day, I talk to my sister, my friends, you know, et cetera, um, about things that had happened. So it's just kind of, to me, it's like out in the ether. Everyone knows, it's obvious, et cetera. Like my discomfort when I walk in the room of like upper middle class folks is like palpable to me. So I'm like, oh yeah, everybody knows, it's fine, whatever. Um, and so it doesn't feel that strange to me because of that, I think. Because of the fact that I had always just assumed that it was so, that these things were so obvious. And also, right, I, again, I didn't grow up alienated in that way, right? Like everyone else I knew was having the same experiences. Sure. So it's less about me and more about thinking about a set of experiences that are, get, are becoming increasingly common, mm -hmm. um, especially for, for black kids that I grew up with. That review in the New York Times mentioned that, and I'm kind of paraphrasing here, but they thought that you could have maybe chosen to amplify your stories as a matter of factness about some of this stuff that's really intense. You could have amplified it so as to make it sort of more identifiable to a largely white readership uh, as far as these tropes and things that we might be used to reading about the black experience. This is what the reviewer said. Uh, but that wouldn't be honest, they wrote, that wouldn't be honest to what your experience appears to be. Do you agree with that take? And was that something you were thinking about? And also, follow up, sorry, how do you think about black joy? and wanting to write your real experience, but not wanting to sleep on this very real, vivid thing that is black joy in America. So, so I agree with, with that. I think that's super important. You know, there's like a whole kind of like lexicon, especially like throughout the 20th century of black writers thinking about this problem of like, is this thing like overdetermined by like sociology that is like white sociology that attempts to say that like all black people are inherently wrong, right? Whether it's like biologically, uh, intellectually, whatever, right? Um, and then this other conversation about like what are the like individual possibilities of like making things in culture and, and making itself and, and all that. And um, I think, you know, there's always some of both in every in every honest conversation that you attempt to have. Right. And I think that that's true about whether we're talking about like um, trauma, the like exemplification of it. And this is like a trope in literature more broadly, especially like literatures about or thinking through, like you know, heroism or coming of age, right? It's always like a special person mm -hmm. who does really special things um, for special reasons, overcomes adversity. You need obstacles, right? It's like the boss in the video game. I didn't want to do that. I was really, really trying to be conscious about not um, suggesting that that was a way that there's something special about me and that you got to like, you know, you're like rose from the concrete kind of person or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. And um, that's related to the joy thing, too, because I think that sometimes, you know, in, in every one of these moments, I try to be honest about the fact that, oh, there is something pleasurable, there is something bad. And sometimes the pleasurable stuff is bad for other people is the problem, right? Or feels bad to other people. And that's a kind of complicated thing I wanted to live in for most of the most of the book, right? Every hurt person who is not you is like a victory, right? Is like a thing that I'm thinking about um, in this. Well, this, uh, this book of yours, this memoir, uh, goes up till around the age of 13 for you, or like mm -hmm. middle school. So I look very forward to reading the stuff you write in the future about the next chapters of your life, because this book is really incredible. It's Sync. Joseph Earl Thomas, thanks for coming on Live Thank Wire. Thank you.
That was Joseph Earl Thomas right here on Livewire, recorded at the Alberta Rose Theater in Portland, Oregon. His memoir, Sync, is available now. I'm Luke Burbank. That's Elena Passarello right over there. We've got to take a quick break, but don't go anywhere. When we come back, we are going to hear a song from singer-songwriter Stephanie Ann Johnson, which they wrote with the help of some school children. But it's actually good. No offense, school children. Um, You want to stick around for it. It's going to happen right after this quick break. Welcome back to Livewire from PRX. I'm Luke Burbank, here with Elena Passarello. Uh, before we get to our musical guest, a little preview of next week's show. Uh, we are going to be talking about surprising and unexpected conversations with Dylan Marin. Uh, I don't know if you remember this chat that we had, Elena. Dylan is this guy behind the podcast, Conversations with People Who Hate Me. Mm-hmm. He would like go find mean things written on the internet about him or other people and then he would <laughs> this was the part I was amazed at he would get the people who wrote the mean stuff to like agree to talk to him he was like befriending his trolls sort of yeah and finding out kind of like what was going on with them uh, so we're going to talk to Dylan about that whole project and sort of what he's learned about the human condition from that We'll also be chatting with the musician Brittany Davis about how, as a blind person, music really became sort of their first language, um, and also why they only recently started getting into the music of Pearl Jam. Plus, we're going to hear a song from Brittany. Also, we are going to get your listener responses to the week's question, which is, what's the most unexpected conversation you've ever had, kind of in honor of Dylan Marin's project? So tune in for that, coming up next week. This is Livewire from PRX. Our musical guest this week can bring a crowded dive bar to a collective hush with their voice, which also wowed the judges on The Voice, like the TV show singing competition. They've also opened for acts including Mavis Staples, Shaka Khan, Ani DeFranco, and maybe most surprisingly, Bernie Sanders. (laughs) Take a listen to this. It's Stephanie Ann Johnson who joined us on stage at the Alberta Rose Theater in Portland, Oregon. What uh, song are we going to hear? So this song is called The Day That You Begin. I was asked to do it by this group called Style uh, in, in that Seattle area. They, they give somebody like me a children's book, and I read the book, and then I go to the kids' school, and I read the book to children, uh, and then I play them the song that we wrote, and then we write a song together, and then it gets put on the internet, and it's a lot of fun. Um, it's about making friends. It's hard for adults, too. You know that. I know you know that. Uh, you ready, Jeff? Yes. All right, let's do it. Listen and learn 
to love yourself on the day that you begin. That's right. <laughs> Na na na. Listen, I used to be afraid. Oh, I used to shake with fear. <laughs> now I know I'm not alone because now you are. That was Stephanie Ann Johnson right here on Livewire. Their new album, Jewels, is out April 7th. They'll also be celebrating their album release with a show right back at the Alberta Rose Theater where we saw them. That's on April 29th. So check that out if you're in Portland. That's going to do it for this week's episode of Livewire. A huge thanks to our guests, Cheryl Strait, Joseph Earl Thomas, and Stephanie Ann Johnson. Livewire is brought to you in part by Alaska Airlines. Laura Haddon is our executive producer. Heather D. Michelle is our executive director. Our producer and editor is Melanie Sepchenko. Our assistant editor is Trey Hester. Our marketing manager is Paige Thomas. Our production fellow is Tanvi Kumar. And Yasmin Median is our intern. Our house band is Ethan Fox Tucker, Sam Tucker, A.L. Alves, and A. Walker Spring, who also composes our music. Molly Pettit is our technical director and mixer, and our house sound is by D. Neil Blake. Additional funding provided by the Oregon Arts Commission, a state agency funded by the state of Oregon and the National Endowment for the Arts. Livewire was created by Robin Tenenbaum and Kate Sokoloff this week. We'd like to thank member Martin McLennan of Portland, Oregon. For more information about the show or how you can listen to our podcast, head on over to LiveWireRadio.org. I'm Luke Burbank for Elena Passarello and the whole LiveWire team. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next week. Dear LiveWire, when we first met, I was really shy. I had no idea we'd spend so much time together or that you'd be one to fill my heart with with joy and make me want to be a better person. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were here. I was busy reading a review from one of our many, many rapturously smitten listeners. Oh, wait, actually, no, sorry. This is from Elena. Anyway, the point is, uh, it would be really helpful if you wanted to leave us a review Feel free to say really nice things about us, and uh, we'll even read them now and then on the show. So you might hear your review of Livewire read on the program itself. Uh, Reviews help other people hear about the show, and then we can keep doing this for a long, long time, because we love having this job. Uh, Thank you so much if you've left a review, and if you're about to leave a review, you can go ahead and do it right where you get the podcast.